Having agency is defined as the capacity of individuals to act independently and to make their own free choices. Tune in to get an inside look at the inspiring uphill climb of businesswomen from around the world. I'm your host, Cheryl Gillihan, and this is Woman Owned Agency. Welcome back, everyone. Today, I've got Barbara O'Reilly with me. She is the owner of Windmill Hill Consulting, and I'm so happy to have her. We spoke several months ago, actually, um, but decided, you know, it really is best to have this conversation now because a lot of my partners and a lot of her partners are actually doing their budgeting for next year. And so it is an appropriate time to have this conversation based on what she does. So Barbara, if you would please introduce yourself and your company. Thanks, Cheryl. I'm delighted to be here. I'm Barbara O'Reilly, founder and principal of Windmill Hill Consulting. We are a fundraising consultancy that works with nonprofits to help them develop the tools, the skills, the confidence that they need to raise more money. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Well, mostly because we work primarily with nonprofits as well. And I know the question is always coming up this time of the year. Um, what do we need to plan for in our budgeting for the work that we're planning to do from a technology perspective, from a marketing perspective? And, and they come to us usually asking the technology question. But then I think that really depends. Like, what do you want to do and what are your intentions and how much fundraising are you going to do associated with that? So which one comes first, budgeting or fundraising goals? And, you know, how do you kind of approach that with your partners? That's a really great question. Um, and it's so much of that chicken and egg debate, which sometimes can trip nonprofits up, right? And I feel like so often we get focused on what we have now instead of thinking about what do we need? What do we have now? Yes. And what do we need to be able to fulfill our missions even more in all the ways that we might envision um, for our organizations? So in a way... It's a, it is a bit of a balance. So it is absolutely approaching a budgeting perspective, a budget, budgeting time with a growth mindset. That's an, almost impossible to do or very rarely done, I'll say, in the sector because um, scarcity and fear unfortunately drive so much of our nonprofit leaders. Um, and that is not a criticism, but it is that eternal struggle of how do we think about growing in all the ways that we need to do, but still being feeling like they're shackled by what they have or don't have now. So I, I really encourage organizations, and I especially do this with clients um, of ours, is to think about what is it that you need to do to really fulfill your mission and your vision? And what does that look like in terms of your budget? And then determine over what time frame. And what, do you have the fundraising pipeline and the fuzz, fundraising support and infrastructure in place to be able to then raise the money that you need over time to, um, to grow in all those ways? What breaks my heart so often is when fundraisers and fundraising leaders are handed a budget and saying, here you go, this is what we need you to raise this year without any basis in trends, what has, what's possible, what has happened in the past without any of those fundraising voices at the table brainstorming and sort of being creative thought leaders with other members of the executive leaders to say, these are, these are the ways that we think philanthropy can help, or these are the other revenue sources that we can uh, be thinking about and, and collectively be using to raise more, you know, raise more money and raise what we need to be um, moving forward in, in all the ways that we envision. So in a way it's, it's, it is a little, it's a both and it's thinking really creatively and, and uninhibited in a way, what, what do we need for a budget? And do we have then the fundraising infrastructure? And frankly, if they don't have the fundraising infrastructure that they need for that growth, that has to be part of the budget also. Because uh, that's also where I see organizations holding themselves back is not investing enough in the fundraising staff and tech and the resources that they need to be able to raise more money. There's so much to unpack in that answer. That's like decades worth of knowledge in two minutes. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. And that just 
you know, speaks so much to the experience that you have in this field and, and how you work with your clients and your partners. I am just in awe of the work that you do. And, and how did you get into this? How did you decide, like, this is the path that I want to take? So my career in fundraising started, um, and if you speak to enough fundraisers, you'll hear, especially ones, those of us who've been around for a while, we all, most of us will say we happened, we fell into this work, right? And there's a whole different philosophy that I have now about an intentional career path. That's a different conversation. But for me, I was frankly, I was um, a junior in college, summer after my junior year, I was looking for a summer job. I called the uh, alumni affairs and development office where I was going to school and asked if they had some, if they had work for the summer. They did. I started working there during that summer, the part-time during my senior year, and I was supporting the development director. Uh, and I was just, you know, writing his correspondence, doing research, helping with events, alumni events, and so forth. And I got a sort of a behind the scenes look at what um, university fundraising was like. When it was time to graduate, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. And I thought, well, I'll stick with fundraising for a little bit until I figure it out. I ended up with a, um, a job uh, at Harvard, working in their development office. And that set me on a whole uh, journey of about eight years where I really, you know, sort of sharpened my skills and cut my teeth in all different aspects of fundraising. And I still wasn't 100% sure this was going to be my career path, but I figured I'll stick with it for a while. And as I grew in different roles, different organizations, increased responsibility, what I loved about it was helping to advance really different and important missions, helping to build and connect donors with those visions that were important to them and important to the organizations, and you know, be able to adapt skills and um, expertise that I have been learning and had been learning in lots of different ways. And so for me, that's been, well, that's why fundraising has been such a fulfilling career. I always thought at the beginning of my career, early, early on, that I might want to go into consulting at some point, but I figured it was long down the road once I'd had enough years under my belt to be able to contribute meaningfully as a consultant. And so um, uh, when I went out on my own 13 years ago, I felt like that was the right moment for me to be able to now give back in a different way and still develop my skills and, and continue working with nonprofits on these important fundraising strategies and tactics and visions. So you started in education fundraising. Yeah. Um, did you stick with that or is that your niche or do you kind of work with all kinds of partners now? So that was my grounding and that was my, my absolute founding days as a fundraiser, but I have um, since moved on right after universities. Uh, I worked at the National Trust for Historic Preservation. So a national organization uh, we, I worked for the American Red Cross National Headquarters, supporting their international services, so global and national. Uh, and then we lived overseas for a few years, and I worked at the University of Oxford. Education, but in a different, in a very different setting. I spent my whole in-house career in big shops with different missions and different organizations. But now as a consultant, we work with organizations of all kinds across the most verticals within the sector. Uh, and, um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to apply what we've learned in-house and as consultants to the to our nonprofit partners. That's wonderful. We also work across sectors and people are always wondering like nonprofits such a big, I mean, that's like niched in, but then they say that that's so broad and that's so big. Like, have you ever considered kind of narrowing that down into a specific sector? And I've always said, well, you know, it seems like when we work in one sector, it, it, blends into the need for another sector and the need for another sector. And for example, you know, we, we worked on wash projects for a while. And mm -hmm. when you provide water to a community, then there's opportunity for education. Yeah. And then when you provide education, then there's an opportunity for workforce development. <laughs> and it just yeah. kind of all comes together. It's not just one sector that you're focusing in on. Um, you're kind of touching them all when you work in a, in a sector. For sure, for sure. And, and it's interesting because you're right, they're all so interconnected, uh, whether it's global health, whether it's education, whether it's women and girls issues and so forth. And so um, whether it's uh, historic preservation, which is one of my early roots as well. So they're all connected in lots of different ways. But the fundamental is 
regardless of the mission, donors are, are, are going to those organizations because it meets their own personal values. It aligns with them. It's the way that they want to contribute back to the communities, to their world um, in, in meaningful ways that are, that are important to them. And that for me is, when I think back at my in-house career working and managing donor relationships, those are, the, those are the ones that really got me excited. I think back fondly about you know, meeting a potential donor, talking with them, getting to understand what drives them, where there's alignment with the organization's mission and programs, and then connecting those dots in a way that gives them as much joy as it does to the organization. That's really interesting. So being in the donor relations seat, um, I feel like there is a need for that abundance mindset and maybe not a need for it, but perhaps it, it grows within us to have that abundance mindset because we understand the, the passion and the values and the heart that donors really have. Uh, but then you spoke earlier about nonprofits kind of having that scarcity mindset. Mm -hmm. And so if there is a whole department within an organization that is focused kind of on that abundance mindset. And yet an organization as a whole, especially when setting their budget, has that scarcity mindset. How do you kind of help bridge that gap? That's a great question. I would say now sometimes scarcity mindsets do permeate into the development departments, the fundraising teams, the, um, the, the donor relations teams. But what I will say is that internally, as teams, as executive leaders, there has to be a conversation about where this organization is going. Uh, what is it that we need to do to realize our vision? And then from that vision, walk those steps back to say, what is it that we need to have in place? There's often this feeling of competition with other organizations who might be who are doing similar work there's uh this feeling of those donors should be giving to us those donors gave to us they should continue to give to us and though i often uh, will advise and train boards and teams that we have to remove the should from our conversations nobody is obligated to be giving to anybody and so to assume that people, that this is an obligation to them is not helpful, right? And it, and it then creates the wrong conversation and the wrong approach instead of that, that growth mindset, that abundance, that perspective of collectively, we're going we're gonna to solve a problem. So sometimes it is really hard to get out of that fear and to get out of that sense of we can't, we can't and shouldn't be investing in the things that are going to help us do more. Uh, so you'll see this coming through in those budget conversations and where money is allocated. Sometimes, you know, often it's programs and external priorities, which is important, but to the expense of, or to the, for the sake of not investing on the internal. Um, there's all the, the whole dialogue around the overhead myth and perspectives around, you know, ratings and, you know, um, uh, whether or not they are appearing to be lean and mean all of that does us in our sector disservice because if our organizations are not healthy and thriving as a whole, then we can't do the missions and the work that we need to do to be effective, to solve the problems. And in a way, a lot of times to put ourselves out of business because we've solved what it is that we were set up to do. Sometimes that's a reckoning conversation internally, um, as Brene Brown calls it, it's a rumble, right? Um, and you've got to have that rumble uh, often to ensure that everybody's on the same page, especially boards, because that's where I often see them thinking only in terms of what money's coming in, what money's going out, and where is it being spent. So having that moment to really be frank and candid about um, how money is allocated and what and for what purpose is important. And those are hard conversations sometimes. Um, it's really hard to overcome those mindsets and to allow yourself the flexibility to think and the, and the freedom to think a little bit more uh, with, a, with a growth mindset. Yeah, that's so important. Um, and not just for nonprofit businesses, you know, for for-profit businesses as well. I mean, it's been incredibly important for my organization to have that growth mindset and to be thinking of that and to be really intentional about our vision and how we want to invest our dollars. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, a lot of what we 
talk about is, you know, the purpose behind how we're investing and being Mm -hmm. impact focused and all of that. But it's just really hard when we have the ups and downs, especially in the last few years with the pandemic, Mm -hmm. you know, to to keep out of that scarcity mindset um, Mm -hmm. and to understand, you know, what the future might look like when it seems seems a little fuzzy right now, what the future might look like. <laughs> right. And, and I will say that when I've worked with organizations in helping them think through whether it's a strategic plan or it's a budgeting process or it's a fundraising strategy and planning for growth in that area, I will often push them to suspend the current reality. So if uh, money wasn't an object, what would they do differently? What would their organization be like? What would they do more of? What kind of teams would they have? And I can literally see and feel that the the stress from their shoulders lift, right? And lessen. They, They start to think and talk differently with the burdens off their shoulders of what they have and don't have. I think as organizations are thinking about their budgets now, Asking that question, which may feel like it's a fantasy question, but it, it's an important one because then it can determine where you're going to go as an organization and how, what you're going to need in terms of resources. That's a question I use all the time when I'm working with organizations on their strategic plans, especially to help them think about the vision for the future. What will it look like if you're successful? What does it look like if you're not successful? What were the factors that drove both of those scenarios? And then let's build that into the plan. Let's ensure that they are putting in place the things that were made them successful in the future and, and mitigate against the things that held them back and might've sabotaged whatever success they had, they were, they could have had. Mm-hmm. It's such an important exercise to do. I know that there are a lot of business books and a lot of applications that I've filled out even to say, where's your business going to be in five years? And I'm like, first of all, I'm in tech. I have no idea where tech's going to be in five years. (laughs) Um, Second of all, I could not have imagined five years ago where I am now. I really couldn't have. So it's a hard question to answer. But at the same time, on the flip side of that, and, and speaking to what you just said, it's important to voice what we want and to put it out there so that we can manifest it. Mm -hmm. I feel like when I have set intention to something and said, this is what I want for our impact. This is what Mm -hmm. I, what, this is what I'm setting as a goal. We have almost always achieved those goals faster Mm -hmm. than we expected because we surround ourselves with the right resources and the right people and the right community. um, And we, we invest in the right ways and we ask the right questions when we start making those decisions because we have put that intention out there. Yeah, that's such a great point. And I find the same, I, you know, as much as I preach to organizations to have, to to ask themselves these questions and to go into these kinds of planning and budgeting processes with an open growth mindset, Um, I often grapple with the same thing as a business owner like yourself, right? And and you don't want to find yourself as the cobbler without shoes. So um, it's, uh, but same, same experiences when I've, when I've really put out their ideas I have for new services or new structures, um, new uh, projects that I want, that I want us to be undertaking, it really does sort of help to drive you know, intentionally and unintentionally, right? It helps to now shape the way we think um, about planning for the future. Absolutely. So 13 plus years in business, what has that evolution been like? I mean, did you, you came from fundraising already. Did you hit the ground running when you opened up your agency? Yeah. And I will say it was, um, um, I feel like I'm in generally in life. I feel like I'm a little bit of a slow of a late bloomer. So um, I started, I went out on my own uh, when my daughter was born and uh, just, just hung out my shingle and, and without a lot of thought to what the business side would look like. And so I was really lucky to be able to start working with organizations on lots of different um, um, scopes of work and continued with that for a number of years. And then at some point I started realizing that as 
the momentum of business and referrals was starting to grow that I had to really think intentionally about what the structure was going to look like. And so, um, you know, rebranded with a new name, with a new identity, uh, with a new brand, uh, and then started to really be more focused and intentional about the scopes of services, uh, the offerings, the, the way we work with clients, and then have over the last few years been building the team as well. And so I don't regret the, the early start because I think most founders start in that way too. It's, it has been, a, uh, I've loved figuring out and learning about the business side uh, and really applying some things, frankly, that I apply. I advise clients on, um, on in a nonprofit setting, but same kind of principles. And also to continue to learn about other ways that I can continue to grow the business over time. Well, they say a mechanic's car is always in the worst shape, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, I will say that like our website hasn't received an update for a long time because we're busy working on clients' websites. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that tends to happen. And it's funny because I will go to, to talks and somebody will say something and I'm like, well, of, of course I know that. I mean, that's what I do for clients. I know that I'm supposed to do that, but whether or not we've done it for ourselves is another story. And so there is that time of like <laughs> reality check. I need to do these things for myself as well. For sure. And I, I've been working with a business coach for a number of years now. And sometimes some of those conversations... <laughs> It is exactly like, oh, the light bulb's going off. Yeah, this flip this flip the, the the roles here. This is what I would be advising your client on, uh, just different setting, right? And so, yeah, I've had many of those moments. <laughs> yeah, that's why even if we're a coach, we need our own coach, <laughs> just exactly. as a reminder. Yes, that's right. To have that accountability partner, that you know, that guide, that sounding board for sure. Well, is there any um, significance behind the branding and the name Windmill Hill? That's a great question. Um, so because I mentioned I got my start at Harvard, um, I spent eight years there. I often would look back on those years as where I really got exposed to fundraising at, you know, on, on that level in all those ways. And, have, you know, I really, I, I, really value that experience um, um, being there. And so when I was thinking about the name for the company, I wanted it to be something that was not always necessarily tied to me and my identity. Of course, I'm the driving force behind it, but I didn't want it to be limited to just my name. So I thought about it and did a little bit of sort of digging around and realized that John Harvard, when he emigrated from England to Cambridge, he actually lived in a place in Charlestown, not far from Cambridge, that's called Windmill Hill. So I thought, well, that's perfect. And I, ironically, I didn't know this at the time, but uh, there's a place in England called Windmill Hill. So they're sort of twinned. Uh, and we spent a number of years living in England. And um, uh, the first place we lived here in the DC area, when we moved here, there's a park uh, in the city where we live that's called Windmill Hill, which I had absolutely no idea about. So Anyway, there are some funny little connections that link a lot of different chapters of my life together. And so I, um, I, it, when I, when I hear and when I see the name and I say it, it reminds me of my starting point and my grounding for me. That's, that was the significance. Thank you for sharing that. And how wonderful that it like just keeps coming up in your life. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Well, um, we're coming to a close here very soon, but we would like to know, are there any um, speaking engagements coming up, any new services or anything that you would like to share with our audience? Yeah, so um, I've got a busy fall coming up for some webinars. I don't think that nothing in person, it's a number of webinars. Uh, we'll, you'll be able to find them on the trainings page on the Windmill Hill Consulting um, websites, whillconsulting.com. Uh, and I do know I've got a bunch of things coming up in uh, 2023 that's already starting to book. So the trainings page is definitely the place uh, to be able to find all the up-to-date um, uh, opportunities, both for in-person and virtual. Now, do you have trainings? Like, are there previous webinars that are recorded that are available for people to look at? Yeah, so in the, uh, there's a, um, 
a toolkit, a fundraising toolkit that's on the website. You can access it by um, just adding your name to be added to the mailing list, and then you'll get a welcome email with the information. And there are some recordings uh, from previous webinars. And then on the podcast page on the website, there are a bunch of web uh, podcasts that I've done. This one will be there too, and um, and it will, uh, and you can find some of the podcasts there too. Wonderful. I'll definitely share that. That's great. Um, are there any other women-owned agencies that you would like to give a shout out to today? My goodness, there are a number of them, but two that come to mind um, are two uh, good friends. One is Christina Taylor of Taylor Made Experience. She is uh, a DC area based uh, fundraising events uh, and events management team uh, um, consultancy. And then the other is a company relatively newish called Barlele, uh, founded by my friend Taylor Shanklin, who is just um, an incredible marketing um, and creative mastermind. So uh, both of those are, you know, personal friends and colleagues. And I have high respect for the work and the quality that they, they deliver to their clients. Yeah, I love lifting up other women-owned agencies and other women-owned businesses we really got into this because we were measuring how many women-owned businesses we were working with. And of course, we support women-owned businesses, but the number when we actually measured was dismally low. It was 3% of the suppliers and agencies that we work with were women-owned. And I said, how could that be the case? Like, that's right. way too low. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's just that we were not asking the questions at the right time. And so featuring you... Windmill Hill and these other women-owned businesses, I feel like it's just really important that we continue to share these out um, because it's not that the resources aren't out there um, and it's not that we don't want to support these businesses. It's just sometimes we don't have those resources at our fingertips and we're not asking the right questions when we're making those decisions. That's right. No, I totally agree. And I'm, uh, I feel like there's greater power in us in all of us lifting each other up, right? In, in all the ways that you've just described. So um, thank you for the opportunity to, to give a little shout out to um, two, women, two women business owners I really admire. That's wonderful. And I'll definitely look them up as well. So thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us today. It was just a small peek into <laughs> what you do. Um, but like I said, in some of your answers, I could just hear the the wealth of knowledge that is behind that and and the wisdom of many years of doing this um, and I really appreciate it I know that our clients are always fundraising to make sure that they can afford uh, the impact that they want to make but the technologies that are driving some of that exponential impact mm -hmm. and you know when they come to ask and ask you know well how much is that going to cost we're always asking well how much do you want to invest yeah. um, because that's kind of the first question. Uh, because we can spend, you know, a thousand dollars, we can spend a hundred thousand dollars and we can spend a million dollars. And it really just depends, like what we implement really depends on what they want to invest and uh, what they're really looking to achieve. And so I think that it's important from your perspective of being the consultant and the development team's perspective of actually doing the fundraising um, to, to understand that, you know, I'm trying to be a good steward of those funds mm -hmm. and, and, and there's not a fixed cost, you know, I mean, there is, there is definitely a cost to things. You, you buy a product that has a cost tied to it, but that same product can cost so many different things, depending on which supplier you go to. Right. So what's the real cost of it <laughs> and, and understanding the, the values you want to put forth when you make those decisions. For sure. And in, all the years I've been doing this and in all the, the studies and the case studies and the, the, um, the stories I hear, you know, the organizations that really do stop to invest in themselves far exceed, far exceed in terms of effectiveness and um, growth the, the organizations that don't. And so it is this, you know, there's a, often a, um, um, a resistance to compare our, the nonprofit sector to the for-profit sector, but the things you just described, right? You know, so our phones that we all carry around with us, we're tethered to. We don't care how much the R and D costs and, and to pre, you know to end the production of that. We just want to have what we you know, the finger what we have at our fingertips, and it's this, it has to be that same mindset 
uh, and perspective in the nonprofit sector? What is it that we are willing to invest in to be able then to leverage and grow? Uh, and all of those organizations that are put themselves on the trajectory are in fact investing in themselves in addition to then the programs and all the other um, mission related uh, activities. And if we only stay focused on the mission related activities without you know um, the other infrastructure, at the end of the day then we limit our effectiveness and we will create donor disappointment because we haven't been able to do the things that we said we do. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. I'm so glad to have you today. Always great to be here. Thank you so much.